Good evening and welcome to Imperial Lakes Online Staying Connected, uh, the latest week-long celebration and exploration of research at Imperial. Uh, my name is James and I work in the public engagement team here at the college. Uh, this week's Lakes programme has mostly looked at human connections in the digital world or via remote communications technologies. Uh, tonight we're going to looking, be looking at transport systems, planes, trains and automobiles and the valuable role they play bringing people together IRL or in the real world. Just this week, uh, the new Transport for London Commissioner spoke of the need to make people feel safe again on public transport, warning that otherwise the city will grind to a halt. Uh, now, those comments are, are obviously in reference to the impact of COVID-19 and the public lockdowns. But in other countries or for certain groups of people in this country, uh, wariness, distrust or, or a sense of disconnection with transport systems was a reality long before COVID. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, how issues around negative experiences and perhaps unwanted behaviour around transport can be addressed from the perspectives of engineering, design and art. Uh, accompanying us on this journey are some prominent and fascinating guests from the world of academia and public art who are themselves collaborating on a new project, creating digital reimaginings of iconic places on Exhibition Road. A bit more on that later. Before I introduce my guests, uh, I wanted to remind you all watching at home that this is an interactive event, so please do send us your questions and thoughts. Uh, my colleagues Amy and Holly are working away in the background, uh, they're monitoring the YouTube chat and will be passing on your comments to me to read out or put to our guests. Uh, could I just ask everyone to be considerate of each other when you are posting in that chat? We want to create a welcoming space for this online conversation. Uh, so whilst we love passion and enthusiasm, let's uh, avoid anything that disrupts the experience for others. So if that's all understood, uh, let's meet our first guests. Uh, joining us tonight are Remy Ruff. Remy is a street and gallery artist whose art began on the walls and trains of South London before taking over gallery spaces in Los Angeles, Paris, Earth and Tokyo. Uh, his connection to transport has endured throughout that time uh, with a recent commission to create station murals for the Hong Kong metro system. Our second guest is Dr. Leila H.B. Hiowali, a research associate at the Transport uh, Strategy Centre here at Imperial. Uh, Leila's research aims to improve the operation, planning and design of transport systems from the perspectives of economics, public demand and user satisfaction. Her recent work shone a much needed light on the different experiences men and women can have using public transport in their own cities, particularly around the sense of safety. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us tonight. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> to kick off, I wondered uh, if I could ask the same question to each of you in turn, if that's OK. Uh, so that question is this. Uh, in our increasingly digital world, what does transport and the, the ability to physically connect, physically meet up with other people mean to you? Uh, I guess I'm interested in it from your personal perspectives and your personal lives and also professionally. Uh, Remy, perhaps I could come to you first. Sure. I mean, to me, um, it, the, the tangibility of connection and connecting to people is everything, um, especially with art. You know, I spend so much time looking at murals and artworks on phone screens. Um, so there's something really um, incredible about seeing those things in the flesh. And obviously you have to travel and you have to move around to get to those places and you have to interact with people. So I think for me, from, from a kind of work perspective, it's really important. Um, and also, you know, from my background as a graffiti as artist, obviously, you know, I spent a lot of my youth on public transport systems, possibly not doing the right thing. But, you know, regardless, I, I learned from a very young age to, to navigate those systems and to, to utilize them to, to the best of my capabilities and to love them. You know, I, I, I love getting trains and buses and, and, and traveling to places and being in that sort of connection to other people who are doing that. You kind of feel like you're, you're in a wave. I think it's quite nice. Is that, why some, is that why some of your early work, you focused on trains and sort of public spaces quite early on, Remy? I, well, I mean, the reason I, I worked on trains very early on was because, you know, in New York, that whole wave of, of the first sort of, 
ideologies of graffiti that came to the UK were from people in New York painting on trains. And, and putting your art on a train that will go from point A to point B to point C to point D, et cetera, was a fantastic way of, of getting your artwork out there. You know, like I did when I was 15, 16, I didn't have a gallery to, to place my artwork in. So that the, the trains and, and walls of the city were were my gallery. So and, and we all as young artists, we all used to travel around the city to, to view things. And it's really mad, even before social media, you know, you'd like get a phone call on the old dial up phones, you know, like there's this at this place and you travel like halfway across London to go and see it. So I, I always talk about graffiti art as being the first social media because I was connected to so many people internationally before I even had a mobile phone. So, so yes, in answer to your question, that's exactly why I did that. And, uh, and over to you, Leila. So the, the original question was around uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the importance of transport and the ability to physically connect in this modern digital age we live in. Uh, that's, you know, you, you've worked on transport for much of your career now. Um, it'd be great to hear about your experiences personally and professionally on, it, on, its, on its value and role. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say that unlike Remy, uh, I would say that my personal and my work uh, approach are kind of more or more different to each other, they are more dissociated. Um, from a personal point of view, uh, just the increased access to digital aspect reminds me of just like the possibility to access apps. And then, well, in that respect, then I would say that it made my personal or my personal travel more efficient just when it comes to commuting or exploring new areas. For instance, when you travel for conferences, well, it, you go to a city you've never seen, uh, obviously it makes it more easy to just travel uh, wherever you want to go. Um, but professionally, I think it has, the access to digital, um, to digital tools has really increased uh, and the ability to answer more research questions. And more precisely, I would say, that it has opened a new door because then it made the access to data, well, actually very much possible. So to give you an example, um, well, access to data is mostly like data uh, either related to, related to the demand, how people travel and also people's perceptions. So that is something that we have through, uh, well, surveys and where we can learn more about customer satisfaction. And it's interesting in itself because we know how people behave, but on the other hand, it's also, it opens us to new opportunities because then we can help tailor better transport that actually cater to people's perceptions and how they, well, what they really want. And in that sense, it's also a great tool to make transport more sustainable. So that's what I would say. Brilliant. Um, that's great. Um, um, one uh, uh, aspect of this, I think, that I think is quite interesting uh, from um, is is around the, the, the subject area of sort of ownership or belonging in a particular public space. So whether that's a, a transport station or or any real public space in a city centre, and I'm interested in how from the, your two perspectives i guess from an engineering e economics perspective and from a sort of aesthetics visual perspective you can create that sense of ownership or or belonging for citizens in the, in those public spaces um it'd be great remy to we could perhaps show some of your examples of your work it'd be great to link that aesthetic or visual aesthetic visual identity you have uh with some of the yeah. public spaces and and you could maybe talk about uh some of uh some of the thinking behind that well, I mean, to, to firstly, to answer your, your question um, and to, to expand on it, I think human beings by nature always take ownership over environment. And, you know, you always hear people talk about my bus, you know, like if they get the 133, they, they, they refer to it as my bus or my station or my local this or my local that. There's always my in it. And I think it's quite interesting how people take ownership and um what one example I'd, I'd give you is that um i did a mural in 2013 which was part of um this project in dulwich to um do like remix murals of 
um, permanent collection paintings from the Dulwich Picture Gallery, which are all kind of Baroque uh, 15th, 16th century paintings. So it's quite an interesting project from that perspective. And myself and a friend of mine, we did a, a remix of a, um, a painting by, um, mine's gone blank, will come to me in a sec, very famous Dutch artist, um, Rembrandt, that's it. <laughs> and it was Girl at a Window, and it's like a young girl kind of standing like, sitting like this at a window. And the original is this Caucasian, European girl, possibly Italian, possibly French, possibly Dutch, whatever. Um, and we did a remix of a kind of Anglo-Asian girl with a baseball cap and a hoodie, but in exactly that same pose. And um, a woman um, came past and said, oh, that, that doesn't really represent the community. And she was a West Indian woman, and I guess she didn't connect to it on that level. Uh, we had a little chat. And I explained that, you know, we were trying to be ambiguous with how we put this character across. I mean, anyway, to cut a long story short, a few years later, I was showing a friend the mural and he was taking photos and she walked past and she said, that's our mural. That's ours. Oh. And she'd taken ownership over it. She didn't remember me. She didn't recognize me. So I think that's that's really interesting how people do take ownership over space. Um, and then to kind of expand on what you're talking about, the projects that I kind of do. So I work in the public space a lot, always in very different um, environments. Um, and one example, I guess, that you're probably talking about is the, um, the subway that I did in Hong Kong, which was in um, a station called Quarry Bay. Um, and I was commissioned by, there it is, I was commissioned by the MTR to design um, a mural that was about 180 meters long um, that was going to be permanent. So that alone was quite a stressful thing to, to have to come up with. Um, and it didn't, I, I didn't want it to interfere with people leaving the station. And, and I didn't want it to be a distraction. I wanted it to be an addition as people were walking through that station, I wanted it to be a dynamic that they could appreciate or engage with as they walked. So I was very conscious of movement. And I think with public spaces, they are constantly moving. So for me, that that's really important, um, how people engage with the space. That, that's the first thing I think about when, when I have to design something like this. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, Leila, um, in terms of that sense of ownership, belonging, feeling comfortable in the environment, how does that, how do you think about that with your uh, economist engineering design hat on? So yeah, if I, well, if I had to translate in economist or transport operators terms, this idea of sense of ownership or belonging, we often look at the dimensions of customer satisfaction or perception of safety that are kind of, well, are the main indicators we would look at when we want to look at these, uh, at these aspects. And well, we have in my work and also people before me, so in this, in the substantial literature, we find that um, the characteristics of the built environment and the characteristics of, of the transport itself has a huge impact on people's perception of safety. And that's not just something that is observed in London or just in Europe. That's something that we see worldwide. Because, well, so at Imperial College, we work and we produce data for a wide, num a large number of cities. Um, so um, there is, so more precisely, we work with two groups. So the first one is the Comet Nova. So that's, uh, I think we've got a map of that. Um, oh, so yeah, so that is first. So the first map is uh, the map of the uh, cities for which we've got bus data, so worldwide. And um, and then we also have, so that's, that's the consortium called IBBG, the International Bus Benchmarking Group. But we also have data from this consortium of, um, of, uh, of metros Sorry, and so that is Comet and Nova, and as you can see, we've got even more uh, transport operators. So the result that we find is that people in all of these cities kind of respond, sometimes in different magnitudes, but respond the same way. So for instance, uh, the differences in groups between men and women, we find are pretty much the same, 
of different, again, uh, different, um, in the intensity of the impact is different, but we kind of see the same trends. So it leads me and my research to say that people have given priors and have perceptions that are more or less intrinsic to, well, their own, the, the travel experience itself is homogeneous. And then depending on the quality of the service and depending on what they see or the type of experience they have, they might, res they might be more or less satisfied or more or less uh, safe. So um, in that sense, these, yeah, I would say it is the nature of the access to transport and the several dimensions of their travel experience that impacts a lot of people's sense of belonging. So this provides um, transport operators with uh, a lot of opportunities to actually work on that and make people feel, well, feel better uh, when they use transport. And is there any sort of aesthetically or visually, is, is, is there certain things that people tend to like to see in a, in a, in a transport setting that, make, that helps them feel at, at ease or that, they, that it's a service that, that, that for them, I guess, that they can access? So, yeah, so in my work, I have found that some aspects, so in terms of actual visual cues, uh, we, you know, it is more in the field of psychology or marketing that we would find, for instance, whether people respond more to a given shape or a given color. But and that's it could actually be interesting if we had data on that to actually look at the impact it has on individuals. And that's something that could be an idea for research. Um, but in terms of uh, the characteristics of the built environment and also of uh, transport itself, where I have found that. Uh, we, myself and co-authors, of course, we found that um, so the size of the carriages has an impact on people's perception of safety. So the larger the carriage is, the more people feel safe. Uh, and also in metros, when there's more carriages per train, people feel safer. And so there's this we find so we interpret this as when if something goes wrong, at least people like have this sort of shelter and they can first change carriages if need be and also they feel more sheltered. But it's not just down to the transport characteristics, it's also the presence of other individuals that make people feel safer in metros in, uh, in the work that, that we've done. So yeah, also that and also the presence of staff has an influence on, uh, on individuals. And I can talk about, I can get back to that in more detail later, but this definitely shows that there are tangible aspects that have an influence on, on the travel experience. Yeah, no, that's really, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely come on to that in, in a bit more detail. So, yeah, just to remind, if anyone does have any uh, questions or comments who are, w are watching this live, please do uh, put them in the chat and we can read them out. Um, but, yeah, I am, I'm interested in the, the, the human presence, the human uh, uh, seeing faces and seeing people in these sort of public spaces, whether it's like faces in terms of your art, Remy, where it's a representation of a person or, mm. uh, or seeing staff, especially when we're talking about, uh, these public spaces or transport systems being used by sort of underrepresented communities or underserved communities, seeing seeing a recognisable face or a recognisable human presence or seeing something that they think is related to them in some way, that must have, I wonder if that has an impact in how, in, in people's perceptions of that being a space for them. I'm not sure, Remy, if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, I think it does. I think it's really important. Um... You know, people, I mean, the spaces without people are just spaces. So, you know, you have to kind of, you know, when, when, I mean, it's one of those things, like even when you're using your local station, you get to know the staff, even if you don't know them personally, you know their face, you know, you know, you recognise them. And I think there there is a certain, it's going to what Leila was saying, it's about a certain amount of familiarity and, a, a you know, kind of almost faux shelter, that, that people have that they can feel comfortable and safe in. Um, and, you know, even, even in, you know, areas that aren't as shishi as Kensington or whatever, you know, they, they still have a sense of community. And it's interesting, I, I, I think that stations, for example, that have adjoined coffee shops or kind of like, you know, little coffee shops inside the lobby of the station. They have a very different kind of feeling to stations that don't. 
and it's that kind of constant usage it's like you see people stopping getting a coffee buying a croissant and you i think you feel comfortable seeing other people comfortable um i don't know if that goes with the art thing because obviously that you know with public art in in those kind of spaces it's it's very transient um i think you can gauge it more with physical things like shops or stalls or coffee coffee stalls I, you know i see it in my you know in, in peckham rye there's a little coffee stand and and you kind of you just see it's like it's constantly moving and there's constantly people buying coffee or grabbing things and it just makes me feel comfortable i'm sure it does other people it just, yeah it, def, it seems that art definitely has a role in people p putting people at ease in space i mean you think of its use in hospitals is increasing is increasing to make yeah. those places feel uh, less like a doctor's waiting room or a, sur a surgical area and more a space where people can feel comfortable spending longer periods of time if they have to unfortunately um so yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know if there there is something there. I think maybe. Well, interestingly, I, I recently did a project for a, um, a lovely charity called Hospital Rooms, and they put artwork into kind of severe mental health units in in mental health hospitals, and they measure the impact it has on the patients and and the people who visit those patients, and it's fantastic. It's such a fantastic project. I was really happy to be part of it. But I was also really happy when they were telling me, you know, how people have interacted with what I've done and, and the impact it's had. So that's firsthand. That that makes you feel happy. Yeah. And Leila, going back to sort of the, the human face of things, does does staffing have you found that staffing has a has an impact on people's perceptions of safety? Um, and does that change between the genders or does it change whether people see a familiarity in in terms of the people who are staffing them, for example? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so it's not, like I said previously, it's not just uh, the characteristics of the of the of the trend of the station itself, not just the number of carriages or the size of the carriages that has an impact on people's perception of safety. It's also the presence of staff members at the stations. So we found that um, in stations where there's more staff, individuals feel safer, and not just in the station, but also all the way to in the train. So I think that is a feeling that that is kept by individuals to the point where actually when you ask them how safe do you feel in the state in the train, they are, as I say, they are satis more satisfied in general and that they feel safer. So that's part of this whole thing of, you know, traveling is not just down to, okay, so you've you've uh, you've got better facilities and uh, well at the entrance of the station and that only makes you more satisfied at the entrance of the station that is something that is kept by individuals that is just part of the whole travel experience um and so that is for the presence of staff but even even the presence of individuals of other people traveling has a positive impact on individuals and both their satisfaction and their feeling of safety. So that could be paradoxical because you might think that in cities like Paris or London at peak time, uh, well, the presence of people can reach a point where it can be negative because then people are just like cramped up in, mm. uh, in train stations at peak time. And I think, well, most of us have known that. Well, but the thing is, uh, just knowing that people are around gives a sense of community, even in cities that are big cities like New York, like London, like Paris, and where you actually might not know the people with whom you're sharing the, the, the tube or the subway, but just their presence has a positive impact. And that is something that is quite interesting because you might think, well, they're not necessarily people you know, they're not people to you who have got like the uniform of the company that then have a sort of figure of authority or like that you can feel like you can go to, but still it has a positive impact. And that is true for both men and women, regardless of gender, that's true for mm -hmm. all age groups as well. And I think that's something that is quite interesting and says a lot about just, you know, urban spaces and societies. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, very, yeah, very interesting. Um, I wanted to talk or ask a little bit about sort of uh, our behaviour within uh, public spaces or with, within transport systems. So that Hong Kong uh, project, a metro project that you were involved in, Remy, were, yeah. was there a, a, 
uh, an aspiration to change how people behaved in the space or moved through the space? It, it wasn't necessarily to change how they used the space. It was to change the space um, okay. and maybe to change uh, their engagement with it, but not, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an exit. So you exit the train onto the platform and then you go upstairs and, or an, up an escalator and that tunnel takes you to the, the station exit. Um, and it's a really busy station. Um, Quarry Bay comes out at a place called Taiku, which is, I guess, you would maybe look at it a little bit like Canary Wharf. So it's very business centered and there's a lot of high rises there with huge businesses. So it's a very, very busy station. Um, and people rush through and, you know, I'm sure you've seen pictures in, in China and Hong Kong of how people move through stations. It's like, it's like, you, it's like a blur. So I guess what we didn't want to do is, like I said, we didn't want to stop people from moving. We didn't want them to suddenly have to go, oh, what's this? So it's kind of designed in a particular way that it keeps moving. And there's breaks in it as well to kind of give people a, a bit of a breath so they don't feel that it's one entire thing. They can kind of see that there's breaks in it so they can engage with it as they walk. Um, it's, a, it's so much to think about when when they they gave me the brief, um, and I really had to kind of investigate the best way to to make people engage with it. It was a, it was a real headache, but you know I'm really happy with what we did, and apparently it works. Um, so, ish. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, look, so I haven't experienced it myself, unfortunately. But well, it yeah, it looks great. Uh, we actually had a comment about the. Uh, someone's experience of St Pancras station which is very close to I think where, where one of your pieces yours is yours yours is across the road was that right Remy? Yeah so we've we've got a, I think it's the biggest mural in London still um, and it's on the Magaro Hotel um, which is right in front of St Pancras and King's Cross station so you've got access to the Eurostar and um, King's Cross um, and uh, we did it the year of the Olympics, so it was quite mad because we saw the public engagement. Literally, so many people were just taking photographs of it constantly. Um, and there's a, the, a restaurant on the ground floor next to the Barclays Bank, which Barclays have now gone, actually. Um, but we would sit there drinking coffee and looking out the window, and we just literally, people were just constantly taking photos of it. It's quite mad. Amazing. So yeah, we had a comment from Miss BD uh, who said that St Pancras is a station I feel safe in, regardless of time of day. But yes, some stations do not feel safe. Uh, oh, yeah, do not feel so safe uh, for, uh, mm. from her, her perspective. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if your mural contributed to that feeling of safety at all, Remy. But uh, <laughs> maybe yeah, I mean, it's, it's a nice that, thing. I certainly walked out of that station and noticed it even before we met, and I didn't realise it was your. It was it was from you. <laughs> well, what was interesting is as we were finishing it, they were carving back the station so the old king's cross station was all being removed um, and making way for the new um uh foster station that was was being built and um so now you have this big piazza in front of our mural which as we were doing it wasn't there so our mural was going on whilst the space around it was changing so before that, you couldn't really sit there and appreciate it. It was, it was, you know, transient. Now you can actually sit there and you see people eating their lunch and right in front of it. So it's, it's mad. It's changed that whole area. So I can understand why people feel safe there. We had another question, uh, which I, I might put to you, Leila, though, Remy, feel free to jump in, uh, from uh, Jagadish, who, who asks, if we are talking about physical art, what's the risk of increasing the accident probability? Overdoing it and grabbing attention is the uh, is the goal making it more comfortable journey or more secure? So I guess either of you, like, do you worry about that, Remy, at all when you're producing a piece if it's too distracting? Not really. I mean, <laughs> I you know, try to make a distraction to a degree. But that's actually, you know, it reminds me of um, in London, well, now when people are just like in the escalators, but well, that's something that has always been exploited as like, well, available brain time in the most uh, capitalist, I don't know, in the most yeah capitalist 
way possible because that's where they put ads. So well, a lot of people acknowledge that this is uh, and the, like people want to grab people's attention in just uh, commuting time. So that's why there's so much ads. But also it reminds me, uh, thinking about your uh, mural uh, that you did in uh, in the Hong Kong station, it actually reminds me of a similar thing that has been done in Paris, uh, but in a different way. So in, you know, between, so in the Montparnasse station is linked to a train station, so it's quite big. And so you've got a massive tunnel between the two lines. And I had every day to switch between, to take to move from one line to the other because I was living nearby. And um, and so they were doing works there. And mm. so that's just like one flat, that's not the escalator, that's just like, you know, one flat thing like an airport where it's just, it is a really long tunnel. And so they were doing works. And at some point, even the thing that helps you walk quicker just mm. walked down. And so that felt like it was the longest five minutes in my life, in my day, at least. Mm. <laughs> and then they've changed that by just putting things uh, at different times of the year, you know, with just stickers. And sometimes it was art, sometimes it was, uh, mm. you know, art, but linked to an exhibition that was uh, yeah. like happening at the time. And that made it completely different. So mm. then you have got something to see that just, you know, takes you out of, the sort of blur of commuting and you know just the routine and maybe it would not make you safer but at least it makes you it makes you more like i don't know it makes your journey more enjoyable so. it engages you with the space you're in which i think is important yeah. and if you're engaged with the space you're in you're you're obviously being made more aware so you're not switched off you're not like zone yeah. now if you're i think you know going back to what james was asking i think if you're engaged with the environment you're in you are more aware therefore theoretically you should be more safe and you should feel more safe mm -hmm. unless it's a really unsafe environment but even then you're aware so you get out of there or whatever you know it's i, I guess that's how it should work and i guess but it's both the richer like I, i'm thinking of those I, I don't know if this was a, a fake news story or a real one, but where you had uh, commuters were given special lanes because because they didn't want to look up from their phone, from their iPhone or their BlackBerry, as they were they were tw uh, tweeting. I don't know if you saw that. You saw that, but there is an element of truth in that. Uh, that you know, often on a commute, you spend your whole time looking at your looking at your screen, looking at your iPhone, mm -hmm. even almost as you, sometimes when you're crossing roads or going from platform to platform. So there's both a a value in i guess there's a value in terms of enriching that experience but also a safety issue of maybe it's, it's not a bad idea to have people more engaged in their physical surroundings yeah. rather than sort of seeing as the commute as an extension of their working day and it's interesting when you you go up escalators that have like animated ad screens now it's kind of taking you off your phone which is a screen yeah. and have like animated images to looking at them as ads, which is, I always think that's quite interesting. So, like, oh, look at this instead. Yeah. Um, I want to talk, I know uh, we were going to try and avoid talking too much about the COVID and the pandemic, but there is a, uh, there is a little, a, an element of a link in that in terms of, in terms of how people are moving around cities or uh, uh, there is, uh, in lots of cities around the world, there's government guidance on that. And um, I think we were talking before about an approach, I think it was in Paris, where they, they, they were trying to encourage people to move around that space in a certain way or to keep distances using visual clues or stimuluses um, uh, 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 on the ground or on walls. I, I don't know if, I can't remember which one of you was speaking about that, but um, or it seemed really really interesting. Really I thought that was quite interesting. So yeah, I think, yeah, the thing you're referring to is uh, how social distancing should, well, was implemented in different areas. So in some areas, there was just a white line on the floor. In some areas, you had a dot where you have two, like a design of two feet where you were supposed to stand. And so in Paris, they did this thing where they, well, in front of schools, I saw one in front of a school that was, you know, uh, waves, blue waves, where you were supposed, there was just uh, right. waves two, yeah, exactly, there was one or two meters apart in, in blue, and that was linked to the history of uh, Paris because, well, the motto of Paris and the symbol of Paris is, uh, is a boat on a river, which is the Seine, the river that crosses, that goes through, uh, through Paris. And, well, that's actually really interesting because it shows that, uh, each area will try and appropriate, you know, uh, a measure and implement it in a different way. But 
I would say from a more transport operator um, perspective, they've the differences, different responses to COVID have been more visible before the lockdown because now they kind of all have implemented the same rules, which is masks, social distancing, and deep cleaning of stations and carriages in metros. But at the beginning, for instance, in Copenhagen, just before uh, the lockdowns or around March, uh, they decided to implement more, um, to increase the number of trains that were going at each station per hour in order to encourage uh, social distancing or to make social distancing possible at peak times. But on the other hand, for instance, in London, uh, both, well, both due to lockdown and also because of financial reasons, after, after the lockdown, they have reduced uh, the number of trains available at peak time in order to discourage people to travel at that time of the day. So you can see here the incentives are contradictory and, well, in one case, this is more costly. In the other case, it makes social distancing less possible. So that's where it's actually interesting to do policy evaluation to see what's more efficient so that if such an event has to appear it has to happen again then we know how to respond to that and not just do trial and error or do it for the smallest amount of time possible uh -huh. i wonder who makes those kind of decisions because um where i live in in dulwich and, and peckham they've closed off at the moment a lot of side streets um which kind of connect different areas quite easily and because they've closed them off you literally have to go huge like roundabout ways to get to other areas now um and the reason they close them off is to have cleaner air in those streets and for the kids to walk to school but now there's so much traffic because everyone's kind of like logged into this one route that's the main route that no one else can really veer off from because it's all closed and surely there's even more pollution from cars i mean I, I don't know but i mean my logic is telling me that this is doing exactly the opposite of what they want it to do mm -hmm. yeah so, yeah maybe yeah. i should work for the transport <laughs> no, but that's actually really interesting because you you might you know that shows that there's no unfortunately there's no shortcut there's no like one size fits all policy exactly even when you think of a city you know one city, London, we can say, okay, that's quite homogeneous. That's not like if we're comparing mm -hmm. Shanghai and Sao Paulo. But mm -hmm. even, even within a city, then if you just say closing streets will encourage people to travel by bike because then they would just drop the idea of having a car. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily true. And that's, yeah, yeah, totally. that's what's interesting. Well, and that's what also needs uh, a solution, of course. But mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want to interrupt what is a really fascinating discussion on, tran on the transport policy situation. But um, as we're coming towards the final stages of tonight's discussion, I just wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the collaboration that you are both involved in uh, that I, I sort of briefly mentioned at the start. So uh, Fantasies of Exhibition Road is his name, uh, and it will see artists and scientists reimagine Albertopolis, that's Imperial's home in South Kensington. Uh, the project will see artists create digital fantasies of iconic places on the round Exhibition Road, inspired by the location, but also their engagement with Imperial researchers like Leila, whose research touches on themes around well-being and uh, stress and mental health. Uh, the project came as a response to the cancellation of our Great Exhibition Road Festival weekend and the postponement of the Kensington Chelsea Art Weekend, but it will form a key part of a new new year-round Great Exhibition Road Festival digital programme to, to engage people with the arts and sciences that will launch uh, that first week of October, uh, which will be in the run-up to World Mental Health Day. Uh, so Remy and Leila, you've been paired together uh, as part of all this mm. to inspire Remy's own reimagining. And it'd be for the last couple of minutes, it'd be great to hear a little bit about how that's going on. Uh, Leila, have you ever worked with an artist or had an artist take such a, a detailed interest in your work? Well, I've actually never worked with an artist uh, because, you know, well, you might think, you know, qualitative research and arts are, some people might even think it's not compatible. But I would say what's interesting is that when you think of, well, I work with data. So most, more often, well, very often, we are asked to make the data talk. So when you just look at raw data, it's just lines, it says 
nothing. But I, we try our best to try and visualize things. So we make graphs and that's the thing that is what we call visualization that might actually look sometimes impossible, well, very difficult to understand because sometimes it makes no sense. Sometimes we use very, uh, well, very technical uh, indicators and so on. So that's the visualization I do in my work. So it's very interesting this time to see, to, to just, well, explore the topics of, of transport and safety and all of that just from a different angle, but still doing visualization in another way. And I'm looking forward to, to see what will come out of it. Rebby, perhaps we can't talk in too much detail or, or about um, what you're thinking of, but was there no, any, any could, sort of themes or ideas that were coming across? So, I mean, I, I basically want to engage with Layla as much as I can on this. And, and I, I want to have something that has a story and a narrative so that hopefully we're going to find some time in our busy schedules to, to sit down together and, and come up with exactly what we want to do and exactly what it says. So it's not just, oh, look, there's a nice visual thing, but I want it to have this, this narrative, which will come from the data that Layla works on all the time. And, and she's amazing and has all this incredible knowledge that I'm going to try and somehow tap into and make some kind of visual thing. I mean, yeah, we, you know, we can't, obviously we haven't done it yet and we, you know, we can't reveal it yet because it's not time. But um, I think you've got an image of one of the fantasy projects that I used as a kind of mock-up to, to visualize how we would- Was that the v &A? Was that the v &A one? The Sackler. The Sackler, so yeah, we can show that. Yeah, it'd be so, good yeah, for you to talk to sort of talk a little bit about what these these reimaginings and why they how they came about and why they why they particularly popular during sort of lockdown would be quite interesting. So in an, in a nutshell, you know, I I paint walls. I have a studio practice and and I work on paintings and have exhibitions, but I paint a lot of murals. And obviously, when the lockdown went into full operation, my my world collapsed and. Um, I was supposed to be in um, Florida for two weeks of May painting murals. I had three jobs to do there. Um, that got cancelled. The next job that I had was cancelled. And so until uh, I think about a month ago, I hadn't done a mural this year. Um, and so when lockdown started, I, I began doing faux murals on um, buildings that I thought were amazing in Photoshop. Uh, I think I reached 33 different ones. I did the Maxi Museum in Rome. Uh, I did the, the Tate um, Blavatnik building. I did loads, the White Cube Gallery, just loads and loads. And I kept doing them because it kept me busy. It kept my mind active. And in a way, this is the process I go through to design those murals. So I was I was still achieving some of what I do, but just not the kind of, the grand reveal project and when we started talking about the um the project for for you guys and for for exhibition road um i just started researching things and i think the idea that we've kind of got boiling up which obviously Layla and i know roughly where we're going with is going to be amazing but this was an early idea when we kind of didn't really know what we were going to do or where we were going to go so you know, this is the the Sackler Square in the V&A, which I was des designed and built quite recently, last couple of years, I think. Um, and I can't remember the architects, sadly, but they're really good architects. Um, and it's amazing. And I just think, you know, it reimagines a very clean space into something very different. And that's kind of what we're aiming for with the Exhibition Road Festival, I think. I hope. Brilliant. It sounds yeah, it sounds like a really exciting project. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to see the final piece. Uh, so I think I mean, it's going to be hosted on the uh, soon to be relaunched Great Exhibition Road Festival website during that first week of October. So uh, we can all yeah, we can all check that out then. Uh, and yeah, it would be great to see what you what you come up with. Um, so unfortunately, I think that brings us to just about the end of tonight's discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Remy, and thank you, Layla, for joining us. I hope, I hope you've enjoyed you. chatting through these various diverse topics. Um, for those nice. watching live, oh, 
for those watching live on YouTube, apologies if we're unable to get to any questions or uh, unable to read out your thoughts. Uh, a recording of, the, of this discussion will soon appear on the college YouTube channel for you to watch again or share with friends or colleagues or whoever you want. Uh, I think there's also going to be a link posted in the uh, chat to an evaluation form where you can tell us what you thought of the event. So uh, if you could spend a bit of time doing that, that would be much appreciated. Otherwise, uh, that's it from me. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in and have a wonderful evening. Uh, for those who are uh, joining us for the pub quiz, that starts at half past seven. So, yeah, look to see you then. Grab a beer or a soft drink. Uh, but otherwise, have a lovely evening, everybody. Thank you very much.